Hey, um, so could you introduce yourself to the SAF members and describe what you do professionally? Um, Chelsea, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, my name is Chelsea Abbott. Um, my title is a scientific advisor, education specialist, and I am also an adjunct faculty. And basically what that means is I am an in-house consultant for a tree care company and I help them with literally anything they might need scientists or science related. Um, but I also specialize in educating people. And then of course, I'm just a faculty for a uh, local college where I teach diseases. Great, thanks Chelsea. Um, Emily? Sure, my name is Emily Dolhansky, and I am a forester with the Bureau of Land Management, and I work on our National Salvage Implementation Team, or NSIT, because that's a mouthful. Um, and I started my position last year, so I'm still pretty, pretty new to it, um, but I've also worked for the Forest Service and seasonally for the Bureau of Land Management, and I am based in Sacramento, California. Great, thanks Emily, and thanks both of you for being here for a discussion on the social media, or the use of social media in forestry. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what both of you have to say on this topic, so um, let's dive into some questions. Um, the first one I have is, how do you use social media in the context of forestry and tree science, etc., um, and what motivated you to start using social media in this way? Um, so let's start with Emily for this one. Sure. Um, so I am one of those forest Twitter users. Uh, so I mostly use Twitter. I've kind of narrowed down my social media use on other platforms. So I don't really use Facebook or Instagram anymore, but I am quite active on Twitter. And I started using Twitter in grad school. I went to um, the Yale School of the Environment. And I remember during one of their open houses, they like really recommended starting a Twitter and using it professionally. And I was like, what am I going to post? Like, how am I going to use this professionally? And it was like kind of a, a mystery to me then. But just throughout grad school, I started posting, you know, like more about my research. And then when I went to an SAF convention, I was like posting like, oh, such and such is presenting. And this is really cool. Um, so I just started to use it a little bit more, um, but I don't think I really started using it quite regularly until um, the summer of 2020, which in California was a really bad fire season. And at one point during the summer, um, at that point I was working for the Forest Service on the Mendocino National Forest. And that was when we had the huge fire, the August complex which ended up being over a million acres. And I was working on that fire as a GIS specialist. Um, so I was making maps. And when they were released, released to the public, I would also post them like on my page and be like, hey, this fire grew like 10,000 acres overnight. That's pretty crazy. Um, and I realized a lot of people were getting their information about fire, like primarily through Twitter because navigating like the Forest Service and the BLM and all CAL FIRE's pages can be kind of overwhelming. So like just clicking on the hashtag like of a fire name and like getting real time updates was how people were getting their information. So I just started posting more about fires. And of course, inevitably, since my day job, I'm a forester, started posting more about, you know, my post fire work and just forestry in general. And I noticed, you know, my following started to grow after that. And I was like, hey, this is a pretty useful platform to talk to people about issues and success stories related to forestry. So that's really kind of uh, when the uptick in my social media use began and I'm still pretty active, so yeah. Great, thanks for sharing your story, Emily. Um, Elsie, you wanna share? Yeah, so uh, so I use uh, I do not use Twitter. <laughs> um, I use Instagram and TikTok. Um, I actually started with the Instagram because I am of that generation where I was like pretty pictures online. Yay! Like here's a disease, here's a mushroom. Um, but then actually I was encouraged, sort of encouraged into TikTok by my friends and family, and then also my students. Um, so I 
started using it a little bit because people were like, you have cool things to say. Like you got weird like knowledge about just random stuff that most people don't share it. And then, um, and then I kind of saw an avenue in which I could engage my students differently. Um, and now it's kind of taken off too. I really just found, I find it very fun just nerding out with people online who also have like this little niche area that they know about. Um, so yeah, it's kind of just, it's, it started off as like a tool and now it's just something that I'm just, I'm just having fun, like, you know, messaging back and forth about this cool mushroom that I saw or like, oh, someone saw a cool insect. So um, yeah, it's definitely, I, I can see the engagement um, as far as uh, uh, social media goes. Great, thanks Chelsea. And I'm glad you brought up engagement because that brings us to our next question. Um, so social media is kind of like a dialogue. It's very much a two-way interaction form of communication. So um, I'd like to little, know a little more about who engages with your content and what their engagement is like. And so maybe we can start with you, Chelsea, for that. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I, um, even though I know this is forestry centric, I tend to be more in the urban forestry world. So I definitely deal more with arborists. Um, and so I would say I have kind of a partial ar people who are in arborist and arboriculture world, um, sort of like checking in on my, my page. And then I'll have sort of people who are just engaged in nature in general. And then like the fun factors, as I like to call them, the people who like to learn little tidbits about nature. So it's kind of like a, it's everyone who appreciates nature um, and at whatever level they do tend to be the ones that are engaging with my content. Great, and um, how about you, Emily? Yeah, so I think Twitter's probably a little different. I think a lot of academics use Twitter and I find that a lot of them follow me, you know, people in the forestry and, and fire intersection, a lot of them interact with me and, you know, we have conversations about, you know, their research and what I'm doing on the ground. Um, and a lot of other practitioners too, because there's, you know, not as many just like boots on the ground foresters use Twitter, because like I said, I do think it is like more, it's morphed into like, an academic playground. Like I feel like a lot of people in academics use it. Um, but yeah, so a lot of people in, in research and a lot of scientists, and then also just like, like Chelsea mentioned, just like average, like normal people who are interested in the outdoors and forests and learning more about them. Um, and then on the opposite end of this, the spectrum too, I get a lot of interaction from people who are like very critical of forestry and specifically like the timber industry um, and who, you know, will often like challenge, you know, what I'm saying or, or, you know, disagree with things that I'm saying. And, you know, a lot of the times I can have constructive conversations with people, but there are also people I'm like, okay, I'm never going to change this person's mind. So I just kind of learned where to expend my energy and not to. Great. Um, thanks for that. Um, so the next question, um, what are the benefits to you and others of engaging in social media the way that you do? Um, so let's start with Emily for that. Sure, yeah, I think just being able to share success stories and being, you know, more personal about it. Um, like, for example, there's a district ranger, a district ranger for the Forest Service that I follow on Twitter. And, you know, like he will post about specific projects they're working on and, you know, some of the successes they're having, whether it's in, you know, like a commercial thinning or prescribed fire. And I feel like it's just more personal coming from like an actual person rather than like that forest social media account. Um, so I think just being able to like champion those success stories and kind of share it to a wide audience um, is, is really successful because a lot of the content on Twitter too can be like more doom and gloom, um, especially around like climate change and some of these bigger issues too. So on like a small, you know, like small victory is being able to share that and like seeing the good work that people like several states over from me are doing is, is one of the huge benefits to me. 
Great. And how about you, Chelsea? Uh, well, I will tell you, um, as a scientist, I feel that we might be a little long winded sometimes. And if making a two minute video on something you could talk for hours about isn't good practice on how to really, you know, be concise with information, I don't know what is. So I would say, you know, one of the fun things that has, it's like a side effect, um, is I definitely have challenged myself as an educator on how to sort of give information in a different way, which I actually do think has helped me be a better educator outside of social media. So that's been a really, a really lovely thing that's helped me in my professional life that I wasn't, I didn't perceive what happened, but yeah, like I said, when you got to shorten it down to like 30 seconds or less, you're like, all right, what do they need to know? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, and so the last question I have is what advice do you have for other um, forestry or in your case, arboriculture professionals um, who are curious about engaging with a broader audience on social media? Um, Chelsea, do you want to start with that? Sure, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I will be honest, I'm pretty new to it still, so I don't know how much advice I have. I guess the only thing I can say is I'm sure that, you know, there are pressures for creating a certain type of content or, you know, maybe swaying with what, uh, what other people might expect, but the where I've come at it is if I think it's interesting and if I think it's fun, um, that's what I'm going to probably post about. Um, and Hopefully people enjoy it. And if they don't, you know, they don't. There's plenty of other areas in the world that they can get their information on. So I would say, you know, it, it, my advice as a newcomer who feels maybe not to give advice is just to social media isn't always about, you know, gaining a following, getting huge engagement. You know, sometimes it's just if you can tell you have one person learn something new then you win. And I think if I can get just one person interested in nature or one person interested in fungi or insects or this weird little niche world that we all sort of live in, I win. So that's my, that's my advice and my philosophy. That, that's really awesome. That's great advice. Um, Emily, how about you? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Chelsea said. And I suppose another piece of advice that I kind of already mentioned was like making it personal. Um, it's a lot more appealing for someone to like interact with another person than like a brand or a company or a nonprofit. Um, so if you're in a position to like have your own, you know, personal social media account, um, I highly recommend that. I, I find that actual people seem to get more engagement than, you know, like forestry uh, companies or, you know, organizations. Um, and also, you know, know who your audience is too. Like Chelsea mentioned, you know, a lot of her students use TikTok. TikTok is generally used more by like Gen Z um, and, you know, platforms like Facebook or, or used by more baby boomers. Um, I tend to think Twitter is like somewhere in that sweet spot um of like older millennials slash like older and younger millennials um but yeah so like making the content that kind of fits you know the platform you're using um and also just like digging deep and you know don't always just like repeat like the you know nice talking points you know kind of like dig into the field and and be able and willing to talk about, you know, problems and, and issues that are facing forestry. Um, you know, you can be an ambassador and still, you know, talk about things with nuance and, and explain the complexities without just like, everything's great or everything's awful. Um, so I think being able to like, speak openly and, and engage in meaningful ways, um, people really uh, connect with that. Great, that is, that is great advice as well. Thank you both. Um, do either of you have any other um, thoughts or opinions or anything to share before we wrap up? You know, as I was listening to Emily talk, I was just thinking, uh, you know, how many, how many people either in our industry or other little pocket industries probably think, you know what, what I have to say 
might not be interesting to others, but it is. It's so, it, you know, it took me a while. It took me a lot of prodding for people to be like, hey, go, go share this knowledge. Because I was like, who would want to know about mushrooms? Like nobody. But it turns out a lot of people do. So I think like, you know, so it can be intimidating. But just like Emily said, I think the more people we have educating, the more people we have engaging, you know, the better. What's, what's the worst if more people know about trees and all the fun stuff about forests? Go for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think like sometimes it can feel like you're just like yelling into the void. But I've had some like very meaningful, you know, connections arise from social media. Like I've started mentoring a student through the University of California's uh, Forestry and Natural Resources Mentorship Program, which I heard about on Twitter. So like I feel like I wouldn't have known about that um, if I wasn't on social media. Um, I've talked to people in my community, you know, about issues in the forestry industry and um, just had like, yeah, really good conversations and connections with people. So it's not just like a, you know, little extracurricular activity that doesn't mean something. I think it can, you know, really be used as a tool for good. Um, and we need more people with like boots on the ground and like you know, field perspectives to, to, to add to this chorus of, you know, people promoting good forestry practices and, and being an ambassador of the field. I feel like you're convincing me to get Twitter. Like, should I get Twitter now? <laughs> oh man, I feel like you're convincing me to get TikTok, which I've like put off. <laughs> Look, there, we'll, we'll have an exchange. <laughs> There's one other forester who like, who's on Twitter, but cross posts their posts from TikTok. And I'm like, oh, do I need to make it TikTok now? <laughs> it, you know, it's the feeling where it's like, do I need to do this now? And then once you do, you're like, eh, you know, you can always stop, but yeah, you know, I know. Give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, any, anything else? Or, this has been really interesting. So do you have a social these. media, Jenna? Do I? Yeah. Um, I do technically have a Twitter account, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I sometimes share my science writing in and mostly retweet other things that I think are interesting, but I don't put a lot of effort into it. Um, and Not I've yet. been learning a lot from these interviews, so this is, this is great. So maybe one day. Maybe one day. There you, you go. Know, we'll see how this article goes and how inspired I get to. I'll put a, I'll put a little Google a, a Google alert on your name. So when when you start, <laughs> I'll be your first follower. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you both for your time, and thank you for sharing your insights and stories with um, with the SAF members. Yeah, thank absolutely. You yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, could you introduce yourself to our SAF members and describe what you do professionally? Sure. So I am Lacey Rose, and I'm a registered professional forester working and living in Ontario, Canada. Uh, my day job is a county forester for one of the upper tier municipalities here, the county of Renfrew. Uh, I've, been in, I've been working for the county for about 10 years now. Uh, so my day to day is everything associated with managing the forest that's owned by the county. So from getting forest ready for harvest to supervising the harvest and doing any renewal planning as a follow up, but also lots of like public inquiries and forest health stuff is a really hot topic the last couple of years. Um, I have a, another job in that I host a few web series, uh, one specifically about forestry jobs called Green Jobs and one about heavy equipment engines called Mighty Jobs. So that's been a bit of a different thing over the last couple of years. And as a volunteer, I co-founded uh, Women in Wood with my good friend, Jessica Kaknavicius back in 2015. So that's been pretty cool to see that network grow. Great. Well, thank you, Lacey, for making the time to speak with me today. Um, this is our last interview for the Forestry Source about how forestry professionals use social media. So I look forward to speaking with you more about this topic. Um, with that, I have some questions. 
The first one is how do you use social media in the context of forestry? And the follow-up is what motivated you to start using social media in this way? Good question. Uh, so in the context of forestry, I use Twitter as a professional forester. So I only tweet about forestry stuff. Uh, my handle is Forester Lacey. And I started doing that because it seemed like the social media platform that was like the most straightforward and you know you, you couldn't speak like a forester on twitter because you're limited in the number of characters and you know how we have the uh, tendency to just drag on and use big words and lots of characters for just like one word so uh it was kind of a challenge to myself to speak in real people language about forestry and I started it because I noticed in my sphere, uh, no one was doing that. <laughs> and I was seeing so many good things out there in the forest. And I really wondered like, why aren't people sharing these good news stories? Um, so I, I make a point to always speak positively on Twitter. You know, I don't really have any bad stories to tell anyway. Like everything I'm seeing out there is pretty great. Um, and I, the reason I wanted to do it was just so that other people, maybe outside the forest or forestry sphere, ideally, would be able to see what Forester does and meet some of the other people that you encounter while working in forestry. Um, I will say that when I was growing up in Labrador, I had a really negative attitude about I didn't even know what forestry was, but like cutting trees was the worst thing to me. Uh, I saw the movie Fern Gully when I was a kid, and I don't know if anyone will remember that, but it really gave me like a negative impression about forestry. <laughs> and I carried that on. Like even when I was in school, I was like, had this bad attitude about like industrial forestry. And then I, that was the only jobs I could get <laughs> since school. So as soon as I started working in forestry, I was like, oh my God, I was so wrong. And everyone I met was so passionate about what they were doing and like cared about the forest more than anyone I'd ever met. So I was like, okay, clearly I was wrong and I'm sure a lot of other people are wrong. And I would like to try to change the public's perception about forestry whenever I have the opportunity to do that. Great, thanks for sharing that story. Um, <clears throat> So my next question is, who engages with your content and what is their engagement like? Um, of course, there's a lot of preaching to the choir. <laughs> um, you know, my network on Twitter is made up of a lot of other forestry folks, but all over the place. Uh, so it's really neat to see and learn about what people are doing in other areas. Uh, also, you know, I use Instagram on a more like personal level to share like the mm -hmm. day in the life of. And I think that's been a really cool platform to get to know other people in forestry that I would never have the opportunity to meet in real life. Um, I don't know if you've ever met like a Twitter friend that you've never met and then you get to meet them in real life. It's pretty cool. Uh, you know, you've been learning about the other person and what they do and then you get the opportunity to meet them. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of a neat way to meet like-minded people. Um, of course, there are some non-forestry people out there seeing the Twitter messages particularly. And I would say overall, the feedback is really positive. Um, there's a lot of, I didn't know that. And wow, I would love to work outside. <laughs> uh, but I would say like the best outcome is when someone contacts me and would like to talk more about like, how could they get into forestry? So imagine if everyone that is a forester was putting out like one message every three months even. Mm -hmm. inevitably some pe people are going to see that and be like oh I didn't know that that was a career option I think it's probably like the best outreach we can do to recruit for future foresters great yeah that's a really good point um and it seems like a benefit of using social media in this way for sure um so that to that point um could you explain a little more of what the benefits are to you and others of engaging in social media in the ways that you do? Yeah, I think it's critical for us to tell the real story. Um, if we're not putting those messages out there, then the only messages that the public has access to is what they hear from 
well-funded organizations that may not be telling the whole story. Um, I think traditionally, at least where I work and live, the forestry sector has been really quiet. Uh, there's been this whole, if we just keep doing what we're doing, no one will notice, it's fine. Uh, but I've always been like, ah, but we're doing some really cool stuff. So maybe <laughs> we could share that. Um, I think in the last 10 years, there's been some organizations that have come on board that have done a really great job of, of sharing positive messaging, like uh, It Takes a Forest and Forest Proud, mm -hmm. um, which makes me really happy to see. Uh, but I do think that, you know, there's a small army of us out there and we do have the ability to change the public's perception and we can give them the information and then they will have the information and can then form their own opinions. Um, there will always be some folks out there that still don't think it's okay to cut down trees, but the benefit is we can make sure they know all the steps that have to happen before a tree can be harvested <laughs> instead of it just being willy-nilly like someone out cutting trees in the woods for fun. Um, and like I said before, I think like a, a big benefit is the ability to grow your network. Uh, we don't all get to go to conferences and especially ones with folks we don't know everyone already. Uh, so the ability to meet people that are your peers, but you don't get face to face time. That's pretty great. And you might find unexpected opportunities. Uh, so I have had been very fortunate to get, you know, pretty random opportunities, but because of social media, uh, just folks who you know, appreciate messages being put out there and invitations to speak or be at conferences in real life and meet these Twitter friends. <laughs> um, it's it's pretty great. And you you might be surprised what comes out of it by just putting yourself out there. Great. Yeah, that's that's great. Those are really great benefits. Um, <clears throat> what advice would you have to other forestry professionals who are curious about engaging with a broader audience on social media? Well, you can definitely start small and just dip a toe in, um, see what other people are doing, find people that you like the way that they are communicating, follow them, look for examples. And then you will just probably start thinking of ideas when you're doing your job of like, oh, this would be really great to share, um, I would say, my number one is to stay positive, um, tell the good stories, use real people language and avoid getting too into the weeds with anything because no one cares that much except you about what you do, <laughs> including myself. Uh, I don't wanna bore people with my actual details of my job. Um, keep to the high points. And although it's hard to resist, think twice about responding to negativity. Uh, it is usually always just a bait and you can't really change the, most of those people's minds. I would say instead create a new narrative with the truth um, and just do your thing. Uh, another thing to consider is to use pictures when you're doing posts pretty much on any platform because that can you know, get people to actually read what you wrote. And although it might seem daunting, put yourself out there. Um, when people can put a friendly face to someone that is caring for their forests, I think it has the potential to change perceptions. I think it also uh, can do a lot for showing that foresters are not all the stereotypes that we once thought they were of the early lumberjack. Um, and if other people can see people that look like them doing these jobs, then they might consider it for themselves. Great, um, that's the end of our questions. Do you have any other thoughts or insights you wanna share about social media use in this area? Um, just that I've really seen people upping their game <laughs> lately. Like it is nice to see that the reach and um, like the, the up and comers in the forestry sector are like, you know, next generation I'm past that now uh they're really great like I don't even know how to use TikTok but I've seen that there's some people doing some really cool things on there about forestry and what a great way to engage the youth I think it is pretty much the only way <laughs> that we can uh hope to engage people with forestry right now 
Um, no one reads newspaper articles or cares about billboards, in my opinion. Um, I think they're they're more apt to watch a catchy video or mm -hmm. someone follow someone on TikTok that's doing cool stuff. So we we have to adapt, <laughs> and just like we adapt our forest management practices with increase and improve science over time. Uh, we need to change the way we communicate and don't be afraid. Um, if someone attacks you on social media, you can just back away slowly and continue to do your thing. It's not the worst thing that happens. So give it a try. Okay. Well, thank you, Lacey, for your time. And thanks for sharing your insights and experience with the SAF members. Thanks for having me. Um, could you introduce yourself to our SAF members and describe what you do professionally? Sure. Uh, I am Lindsay Rustad, and I am a research ecologist and team leader with the USDA Forest Service. I'm also a co-director of the Northeast, the USDA Northeast Climate Hub. And um, I would say I've spent the last three uh, decades trying to figure out what makes forests tick and particularly how they uh, respond to and uh, often recover from large-scale disturbances like air pollution, climate change, um, and extreme weather events. Great. Well, thanks for being here, Lindsay. Um, <clears throat> as you know, this is one of our interviews for the forestry source on social media and the use of social media in forestry. Um, and I invited you to this uh, conversation because I'm aware of the ways in which you use social media um, in addition to other forms of outreach. So I'm looking forward to hearing your perspectives on things. Um, so with that, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is how do you use social media in the context of forestry or forest sciences? And a follow-up to that is what motivated you to start using social media in this way? So um, I use both Twitter and Instagram. And I joined Twitter back in 2015 and Instagram uh, a couple of years later. Um, both of these are what I think of as personal professional accounts. And um, I warn my followers that I'm gonna post on uh, forest ecology, but also on things like fly fishing, bird watching, the great outdoors and kind of art science. So kind of a, 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 a wide plate of, of things that, that I do post on. Um, um, that said, um, I use my um, Twitter account as more of a professional account, and on that one, I share news on people, places, things, and events. So I share news on people, kind of in ecology, in forestry, in the art world. I like to share on, on places, you know, what's going on at ecological research sites like the Hubbardburg Experimental Forest. Um, I like to share um, things, um, interesting new sensors or tools that we're using, and certainly events like conferences or key benchmarks and ecological experiments, art exhibits. So, so that's kind of my Twitter. My, my Instagram is more personal, and it's really meant to be more of what's it like in the life of a forest ecologist, or what's it like to be a woodswoman, uh, or what's it like to, to live in the great North Woods? Uh, much more storytelling, I think, in the Instagram. And really, my goal in the Instagram is, is to connect people with the great outdoors. Um, in both accounts, um, I also try to always um, share something, um, and I think about this a lot, uh, that might be by of interest to the audience, kind of a, a fun fact, a reflection, an overall message and conversation. So, so that's kind of what I do. And, and I got involved with this because uh, probably through my kids um, who are now uh, uh, my who are now adults, um, but just realizing that there is a raging conversation going on out there. And I just decided that I wanted to be a part of that conversation. Um, and that conversation is the online conversation. Great, thank you. Um, so you, you just mentioned um, being part of the conversation. So one of the ways that social media is different from other forms of science outreach or forestry outreach is that it, it can be so two way. Um, and more of a dialogue. So that leads into the next question. Um, who engages with your content and what is their engagement like? 
So um, I think of, of having several different audiences. So again, on Twitter is my, my more professional um, account. And in there, I would say I engage with scientific colleagues, um, people in conservation, forestry, uh, grad students, and occasionally the outdoor folks. Um, and definitely a two-way sharing of information. I'm sharing, you know, the people's people, places, things, and events in my life, and I'm absolutely learning the same from from other people who are out there. So it's very much a, a two-way. I, I wouldn't say it's always a dialogue, but it, it's a two-way exchange of information. Uh, my Instagram is more friends, friends of friends, students, and more recently I've been engaged, I don't know if you follow that, but the If Then community. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an, an initiative that was started by Lida Hill Philanthropies, you know, trying to create more, you know, role models and images of women in science. And so I've really you know, kind of stepped up my game in, in trying to post images of not always myself, but, you know, other women, women in forestry, women in the outdoors, you know, out there so that the girls, particularly aimed at middle school girls, you know, can see that women can be out there, they can be scientists, they can be fisher, fisher people, um, and can be engaging in, in the outdoors. Uh, so those are, are kind of two, two different audiences. I, I also say I'm also an, an avid angler, so I'm a fly fisher. So in my Instagram community, I, I also try to engage with the fly fishing community. And this is another community with you think about it, there's a lot of images of, um, of men out fly fishing. And I'm part of a community of women who are trying to get more images out there, more content out there on women um, being fly fishers as well. Great. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so my next question, uh, what are the benefits to you and others of engaging in social media as you do? So I, I think of it as is what I try to post and, and then what I, I get out of it. So for my posting on Twitter, um, the benefit for me is it's another way to communicate about what I do. So I can spread the word about publications, about events, um, about what we're doing um, in the world of, of forest science. Um, not so much what it's like to be a forest scientist. So Instagram for me is the reverse. I'm not so much sharing what we do as forest scientists, but I'm trying to share what it looks like uh, to be a forest scientist. So I kind of use them in, in different ways. And then for my engagement, what I get out of it, as I said before, is just learning so much about what other people are doing out there, um, just in, in papers, publications, new experiments, new conservation e efforts, just kind of getting to know some people in the online community. Great. Um, what advice would you have to other forestry professionals who are curious about engaging with a broader audience on social media? So, um, so that was a good question, and and I thought about that a bit, and and I have I have a number of things to to share. Um, one I, I think is is just to recognize that there is an ongoing conversation and community that's happening out there online on social media, and you can choose to be a part of it or not. Um, I think of it a little bit as the, the water cooler or the coffee room, right? You can choose not to talk to people there, um, but you might miss, you know, some things that are, that are happening on a professional and also on a personal content. It's kind of nice to know some of the things that are going on in your colleagues' lives. Um, the second thing is it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Uh, choose a platform, start following a few people you admire, think about what you want to share and engage when you have the time. It doesn't have to be all, all the time, it doesn't have to be all consuming. Um, the third thing is if you choose to engage, take some time to think about your social media persona. You know, sometimes we think of it as, as our avatar, like, who are you? You know, and what are you going to share? And, and really importantly, what are you not <laughs> going to share? And, and in that similar in that similar vein, always, 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 always think before you post. Uh, you can go back and delete a post, but once someone has seen it, you can never make it unseen. So it's super important to be professional and, and respectful and at all at all times. 
Um, the, the other thing that, that I think is important for, for us in a professional level is, is be careful or think about whether you want to mix professional and, and personal. Um, I think they don't mix so well. You don't really want to post pictures of your grandbabies um, on, on your professional account. I actually um, have another Instagram account and I have a Facebook account, which is where you know, I post with, with family and friends. And then I guess really the final thing is, is enjoy it, have fun with it. It's meant as another way to engage, to communicate with our colleagues and uh, particularly now in the, in the time of COVID, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to, to see what's going on in other people's lives. Hey, thank you, that was excellent advice. Thanks for sharing. Um, before we close, do you have any other um, thoughts or perspective or insights you'd like to share relating to this? Yeah, I, I, I guess the, I guess the last thing is, is don't be, and, and maybe I'm speaking to some of my older colleagues, <laughs> right? I, I think that the, the younger generation are just all of this. They don't need my advice. I think I'm more, more speaking to some of the older generations is, is don't be afraid of it. Um, it, it's a wonderful medium. It's actually very easy to use. And like I said, some people think that if you get involved with it, it's going to be all time consuming. And, you know, you're going to sit and be consumed in your phone watching everything. You, you really you really don't have to. You can engage it at whatever level, you know, suits you best. Great. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, and thank you for your time and for sharing your insights and experience with the SAF members. Thanks for having me. Okay, um, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, could you introduce yourself to our SAF members and describe what you do professionally? Um, let's start with Alex. Um, hi, I'm Alex Ashby. I work for the Albany Water Department as their forester. Um, I manage several thousand acres of, of property um, for the purpose of water quality. And also with regards to this, I run a TikTok account um, called Number One Free Tree Friend um, and a Twitter account that shares those videos, um, just trying to talk about forestry and kind of the day-to-day -day realities of forestry and forest ecology work. Great, thanks. Um, next, can we talk to Neil. Um, could you introduce yourself? Yes, hello. I'm uh, Dr. Neil Thompson. I lead the Applied Forest Management Program at the University of Maine, University of Maine at Fort Kent, always when it's being recorded, and also the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit out of Maine. Great, thanks. Um, and Tom? Hi, my name is Tom Kimmerer. I'm a forest scientist uh, with a background both in forestry and in plant physiology and biochemistry. Uh, I'm a former faculty member at the University of Kentucky, and now I uh, work as a consultant on managing uh, very ancient trees in the bluegrass. Um, and I'm active on Twitter. I used to be active on Facebook and, and Instagram, but I kind of gave up on them. The, the uh, information density on Twitter is much higher. And on Twitter, I mostly uh, talk about science and uh, not just forestry, uh, uh, but science in general. And, um, I found it a I found it a great place to talk to other people. Um, and as you all know, you can be selective about who you pay attention to. And I think I'm I'm writing my second book right now, and I think I get about two or three ideas a week from Twitter that are going to wind up in the next book. So. I think it's very valuable. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so uh, we're here today uh, to discuss how forestry professionals use social media. So like has been mentioned, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, et cetera, TikTok. Um, social media is a relatively new phenomenon that's rapidly transformed many aspects of how we engage with each other in our society. And forestry is not exempt from this, and all of you and those that we'll speak to in future interviews um, use social media to participate in these digital conversations about forestry, and I'd love to chat with you more about um, your experience and your perspectives on that. Um, so my first question 
is how do you use social media in the context of forestry and what motivated you to start using social media in this way? Um, can we start with Neil for that? Sure, so I use social media, mostly uh, TikTok and YouTube to communicate short and long pieces on forestry, trees, ecology to either a general audience or sometimes directly to my students where a general audience can also see it. And the benefits of that, many people have no idea what a forester does, what a forester is, what the profession of forestry is all about. So I try to give them a small window into that field. So I joined TikTok when we were actually in the last day of classes before we shut down for the first time for the pandemic. My students uh, were very into that platform and said, Neil, you've, you've got to do it. And at the time, I'd been maintaining the Instagram and tick, not Instagram, yes, the Instagram and Facebook accounts for the university program because I was the youngest faculty member and that's how that goes. But they said, Neil, you're good at this, we enjoy it, but TikTok is where we all are, so please join. So after that uh, last goodbye to my students before we sent them all home to uh, Zoom land, I created a TikTok account and the rest is history. So I am at Forestry Prof on TikTok. I have, I think 117,000 followers and uh, it's a combination of short vignettes of what I'm doing that day in the woods or uh, whatever management, lesson, lab, lecture, Whatever's going on, very briefly summarized. And I, I see TikToks as more of a paragraph where it has a single subject, stick to that subject, beginning, middle, end, over. And in contrast to that, I also have the UMFK Forestry YouTube account, which of course, much longer form. I do more entomology material there and primarily the GIS tutorials. So very different versions of Neil that you get on uh, both uh, platforms, but it's it's amazing how little bleed over I get between the two. And then when somebody finds both, it's this amazing experience. But I've also learned from other faculty members on TikTok that it can be very productive to try to summarize a 60 minute lecture down into just 60 seconds, because that's all you get on that platform. It can really help you to consolidate and organize the thoughts in that way. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, next, can we go to Tom? Yes, I um, I do two things right now in my professional. Well, three things: write books, but I, I um, a lot of what I do is informal adult education. I teach what we call field courses. So I'll go to a botanical garden or a nature center or someplace like that and take people out in the woods and teach them about trees. And I don't do the typical let's go identify all the trees here. I talk about what they're doing because I'm a tree physiologist. So I like to teach about, about the trees are really interesting in terms of what they're doing and they're not as static as people think. And, and I, I, I started using social media sort of to keep in touch with a lot of those folks. Uh, I mean, before the pandemic, I had done, the, the year before the pandemic, I had done almost a hundred uh, field courses in various places throughout the, this region. Of course, that all ended with the pandemic. We're about to start picking that up. So part of what I use uh, social media for is, is reaching out to those folks. Um, but more and more, I'm using Twitter to talk to other people in forestry and related disciplines, like physiology, biochemistry, forest genetics, et cetera, uh, just sharing information and, and just sharing experiences. Um, I also interact with a large number of graduate students um, sort of helping them out with their programs. I guess it's sort of something I got used to doing as a professor, and now I just do it for people who follow me on Twitter. I find it very rewarding, and especially during the pandemic, of course. I saw more people on Twitter than I did in real life. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Alex, how do you use social media in the context of forestry? Uh, so, like I said, I started my TikTok account about a little over a year ago now, and I tend to try to make these short kind of instructional videos. A lot of the time it's about something that I am currently working on, or 
as some like broader event. Um, I had a couple of videos for National Invasive Species Awareness Week a few weeks back. Um, by the way, I just wanted to say both Tom and Neil, I've followed you both forever. So like, <laughs> I was kind of starstruck when, when I got the email and I was like, oh my goodness, I know both of them. Or I feel like I do. Um, so yeah, so I'm trying to <laughs> communicate these very complex ideas in a way that makes sense to people who are paying attention and Really, the the goal for me is to get people to just look around more um, and also to get people who might not otherwise be interested in forestry or uh, realize that like forest ecology or field work or any of this is an option in life. I kind of want them to see that this is something you can do. And this is something that you can start really small doing. Um, and it's incredibly complex, but it's also very simple, like in both the broad and the small terms. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how coherent that was. That's very good, that's very good. Great. Yeah, thanks, Ali, great. Um, so the next question that I'd like to discuss with you relates more to um, the fact that social media is sort of a two-way um, communication mode. And so as, as you can share messages with people, others can interact with you as well. Um, so the next question is who engages with your content and what is this engagement like? And for this, I'd like to start with Tom. That's a very good question. Um... So I, I sort of deal with several slightly discrete communities of people, uh, biologists and forest biologists, um, climate change folks, uh, and then sort of a more general public. And the climate change interactions are very important and interesting. I, I, my professional work right now is primarily regarding um, carbon sequestration in forests and woodlands. And so I interact with a lot of folks and one of the things I was thinking about as, as Alex was, was talking um, is that the need to be able to communicate in, in lay language and not use technical jargon. Uh, and, and that's, a, you know, Jenna, you were saying that you like writing. I think that's, a, you know, it's a skill that we have to develop over time. Uh, you know, my, my books are for lay audiences and not for technical audiences. And my field course teaching are for lay audiences. So I've gotten used to kind of this way of communicating that avoids jargon. Uh, and, and I have to say there are some people, including some people with lots of followers on social media that speak in arcane language that's very hard for a lay person to understand. I think it's critically important because I, th I think what I hear from all of us is that we're using social media as a way of broadening the audience for forestry and related subjects. Um, and the only way of doing that is to speak in relatively simple lay terms. And then the other thing I'm careful about is not to engage in argument. Um, you know, if somebody challenges what I say, I either say, okay, or ignore it or something. But uh, I, I, it's not, I, I understand that social media is, is a space where a lot of people take some pleasure in having arguments, and I don't at all. Neil's nodding his hand. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tom. Those are great insights. Um, Alex, do you want to answer this next? Sure. Uh, so I've had a pretty mixed audience for my, uh, my stuff, both on TikTok and on Twitter. Um, I don't have near so many followers as uh, Neil <laughs> on TikTok. I'm nearing 5,000 now, I think. Um, but I tend to get a lot of people from both the, like, I didn't know that porcupines could climb camp, um, <laughs> yeah. and from, uh, I've had a couple people reach out, um, comment on the videos and say things like, hi, I'm, I'm <coughs> a queer forestry student and like, it's not just me or, uh, Thank you for articulating this in a way that 
like makes sense. Um, I've had a fair amount of interactions from other people within the field um, at kind of various levels of, of their career. Um, and I, I'm really trying my best to reach those like slightly younger people. Um, just to say again, this is something you can do. Um, but yeah, I've had overall very positive experiences. Um, TikTok is tough because it's just videos. Um, Twitter's a little bit freer. I've been able to share some articles and other things that I've found uh, that were really interesting and hopefully can help people think a little bit broader than they would have otherwise. But yeah, every it's it's mostly been, I think, slightly younger people, more or less within the field, and they have been wonderful. Great. That's awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, and Neil, do you want to share um, about how people sure. engage with you? Sure. So first of all, Alex, I, I think you do what you do very well in terms of explaining the, uh, the concepts that you choose to take on. So what you're intending to do, I think you're doing spot on. And within TikTok, you're, you're sort of grouped into different categories. And Alex and I are part of the relatively small forestry group network, if you call us. There's much larger networks of uh, loggers, wildfire crews, woodworkers, and all of these different groups sometimes interact and sometimes keep in their own little bubbles. So what we're doing is sometimes communicating within our own network, and a lot of the videos just sit very tight within that, and others explode all over the internet, and there is no way of knowing which one it's going to be. I have 117,000 followers, about 60% mm, of them came from videos that I made as sort of a whim. This is an interesting point, here it is, goodbye. And my phone is blowing up for three days. And today I had one, it was a video I did a while ago. I dressed it up a little bit, redid some parts. It's about pruning a red pine. Within an hour, I think it had 10,000 views and a thousand likes and wow. people realizing for the first time that knots and branches were connected. And that's wonderful. <laughs> but I have yeah. another 150, 200 people following me because of this thing that I consider to be fundamental, essential, and almost boring. But to so many other people, it's brand new. And that's what I think, Tom, you're getting at there. We have to remember that as, as much as we gain knowledge and carry that around with us, so much of it is brand new to so many people and can be fascinating to them, things that we take for granted as essential. So in terms of the engagement, it's, it's everything from the forestry student at a different school who might say, hey, thanks so much. We just talked about that in class. It's another way of looking at it. Thank you very much to some small landowner who might have never engaged with a forester before. And they see something that I've done, say, could I do that on my wood lines? You know, I've talked to somebody in your region who knows things, but very likely so. And sometimes there's short Q&A questions like uh, sugar maple under climate change is good prospects where I live, poor prospects where most of you live. Yeah. Sorry about Kentucky. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> And sometimes there's much longer form videos. And I have been finding very good engagement with climate change topics. Everybody knows something about what's going on there, but a lot of the details about what we deal with in our day to day is foreign to a lot of people. And I think they find that both interesting and comforting that there's people in the woods who work with us every day and have a, a working perspective on that they might not have uh, considered. So it's, it's the whole range. And especially when you get into a video that for whatever reason does very well, you get a much broader and broader audience every time the algorithm pumps that out to another level. Great, thanks for sharing that, Neil. Um, Do you mind if I jump back in? Follow up, sure, go ahead. Um, so like Neil was saying, there's some very fundamental pieces of knowledge that we as ecologists or foresters or people with any kind of training take for granted. And that's true for every field. Um, and I personally was brought in on a book club a while back that some woodworker found me 
through my TikTok videos and we did like a little Zoom book club. Um, and these, it was me and one other forester and I think three woodworkers from around the country. And they have, they know wood better than I do. They <laughs> know how to work with it. They know what looks like what, what's good for what, it's beautiful. But they were asking me questions about like, what do you mean by embodied carbon? Like what does, like we hear all of this stuff about forest as a climate solution, but like, how does that actually work? Um, and so it's just a reminder to, you know, you don't know what you don't know, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, thanks for sharing If that. I could add to that, if oh, I could yeah, add to that, I, that's, this is mm -hmm. an interesting discussion. Um, I, I made a, a personal decision in 1982 that I would never give a public lecture without talking about climate change. And as you can imagine at the time, everybody went, huh? <laughs> Even though Eunice Foote discovered it in 1856, most people have not known about it until recently. Uh, and so there was a lot of explaining to do, but now what I'm seeing is sort of the flip side, which is a lot of people are despairing, especially younger people and thinking, oh my God, climate change is gonna kill us all. There's nothing we can do. And I keep saying, oh yes, there is. We're doing it, you know? So I think that, that one of the opportunities that we have in these kind of social media interactions is to be realistic and honest about how we're gonna address this, you know, the, the most important, well, I would say the two most important climate change and, and biodiversity, uh, which are areas that all of us can have an influence in and have an impact on. Right. Yeah, thanks. And I'll, I'll just, I'll just okay. add my, my, favorite, my favorite aphorism, and, and I, I've never been able to find out exactly where it came from, but it is, uh, there's no point in being pessimistic. It doesn't work anyway. <laughs> really great. Um, so the next topic, this has already sort of been touched on a little bit in all of your responses. Um, but I'd like to ask a little more directly, um, what are the benefits to you and to others of engaging in social media in the way that you do? Um, and I'd like to start with Alex for this one. Uh, the benefit to me is that I get to talk about trees with people more and constantly. Um, <laughs> if if we're honest, this is what I do anyway. You can ask anyone that's like, gone on an innocent hike with me or like walked around the neighborhood and it's it's a problem but <laughs> so it's it's just kind of an outlet for all of that for me um and I also have done a lot of teaching in various capacities um I've been like a TA basically a teacher for a bunch of different labs for like freshmen um and a few higher level courses during my schooling. Um, I've done a lot of outreach events and volunteering with younger kids and like middle schoolers even, which they, they don't deserve the bad rap they get. <laughs> They're sweet kids. Um, but I always found that kind of teaching and outreach to be very, very rewarding. And I've had people over the years tell me that I'm very good at it. So I like, to kind of stretch that muscle a little bit. And again, I just really like talking about trees constantly and always, so it works out great. Um, and I hope that the benefits to others are, like I said, seeing some kind of representation. Um, I have been in many forestry classes and in jobs where I was the only like, femme person. Um, I have been in positions where I, in undergraduate school, I was in the forest health major, not forestry, technically. Um, and so that was very othering when I was in the forestry courses, even though forest health and forestry are like right next to each other. Um, but yeah, I, I want I, I hope that the people in my audience are able to kind of expand their idea of what a forester looks like and kind of what the field is. Um, and also just see some cool stuff that they might not otherwise have noticed. 
Great, thanks, Alex. Um, next, Neil, do you want to answer this one? Yes, um, Alex, you took the words right out of my mouth on the compulsion to teach and compulsion to lecture, and it's an outlet for that, in, especially during a time when I had relatively little face-to-face -face interaction, that I think a lot of people have found that with social media over the last two years, and that's, uh, it's allowed a level of interaction that otherwise was lacking, that for a variety of reasons, mostly pandemic-related. But I, I do think it's made me a more effective lecturer, that learning to condense points down to the degree that TikTok demands and seeing how a much wider variety of people respond to what I'm delivering. That my forestry classes, Alex, I'd be shocked to hear, are pretty homogenous. And that uh, one, I, I hope to broaden the reach of the program and the profession through a broadly popular platform, but also to see how people of all ages and backgrounds respond to basic forestry content. That I think I can learn to, I think I have learned to explain it better through that, uh, through that experience. My, the, the, of course, the self-interest in this, I would like to have more students in my program and in all forestry programs. That the benefit that I hope is people realize forestry is a profession that's available to them whether they have a parent or aunt or uncle or somebody who's in the profession, which is very common, or if they grew up in a city somewhere and they just saw it on TV or TikTok and said, oh, I'd like to give that a shot, they can. And I'd, I'd love to have them make that decision if it's for them. At the same time, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything. I'm not saying you, you're, you must do this, that I, I would like people to make a considered informed decision about going to college if they so choose or going into a technical job if they so choose. But I think what the whole forestry network on TikTok is doing is showing pretty well the range of things that you can do. More would be better, and we'll get to that, uh, I think, in a bit. But I think the more people see that I came into the profession because I had family, not directly in it, but proximal. And I think the majority of people, whenever I ask, are one degree of separation from somebody in the field. And I think that is limiting our, uh, our pool, that we should, we are available to everyone, we should be available to everyone, but the information and the knowledge of what the profession is, is what's in the way of that. And that's maybe idealistic in some ways, but I think that if more people knew that they could, they would. So that's the benefit and people learn small snippets. And I've had a lot of people who own an acre, a tenth of an acre, one tree. So yeah, I, I learned something that I can apply to my tree. And foresters do not normally engage with people who own one tree. That's an arborist job. But we can uh, provide some basic information that they find useful in that way. So other benefit to a broader audience. And now, as of today, one more person knows that knots and branches are connected. My work here is done. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, Tom, do you have any more to add? Yeah, I just want to say I, I, uh, I, I'm among other roles a tropical forester. I lived and worked in Indonesia and Malaysia for a number of years. Um, I'll just say this as an aside. I used to live on the equator, by which I meant uh, I would send my children postcards saying, uh, I'm going to the Northern Hemisphere for breakfast. I, I live literally uh, two blocks from the equator, <laughs> which is fun. But um, I am very intrigued by the international nature of social media. I interact with a lot of people in, in Southeast Asia. I interact with a lot of people in Africa. Uh, and that's very interesting because many of those people have access to social media, but their access to other kinds of intellectual and training resources are quite limited. Um, I'm going to be going to Mozambique as soon as the the uh, pandemic allows. But in the meantime, I have conversations with Mozambican biologists and foresters and Kenyans and people all over the world. And that's uh, just, I think, a real strength in social media is that, you know, forestry always has been a very international discipline, even though we work in our own local forests. And, and social media really enhances that ability to speak with people from different backgrounds. Great, good points. 
Yeah, if I can uh, chime in on that. Yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, you know, a little bit on TikTok, more on YouTube with the uh, GIS content in particular. I, I have a lot of those same experiences where I've had mm -hmm. questions from Saudi Arabia, India, Vietnam, all around the world. People I never would have interacted with otherwise that I, I've traveled very briefly, but not nearly to the extent that Dom has. But to have regular contact with people all over the world is a fascinating experience. Great. Um, and there's just one more question for all of you. And that's um, what advice would you have to other forestry professionals who are curious about engaging with a broader audience on social media? Um, and can we start with Neil for this? Oh boy. So number one, assume the highest ranking person in your organization will watch your videos. That <laughs> I went from, Neil, do you really want to be doing this? And my, my TikTok is my personal TikTok. It's not UMFK Forestry. We started out that way and I was, I was suggested that I not do that. And that was before I had 117,000 followers. After I did, I found myself in my GIS lab presenting my material to the presidents of every humane campus in the system. And that was a interesting turnaround that that is a fact of life that it is not private. A lot of people do treat social media as a bit of a diary. I do not suggest that. And assume that the president is watching and act accordingly. That I don't tend to do anything that I would be embarrassed by. I act like I'm in public because I am in public. And that's, that's simply the nature of the beast. Um, number two is it's sort of a personal choice. There's the whole field of science communicators who condense scientific material and present it to the public. It's a specialty. It's one that I don't particularly have. And well, maybe lecturing is a bit of that sometimes, but I prefer to stay in my lane that whatever video I'm making is going to be about something I've done, something that's in progress, something that is uh, something that I can see, touch, feel, show. That I will not make a video about wildfires out west. I have more knowledge than the average person about some particular topics. I know way more than the average person because I did do my doctoral work in central British Columbia in a fire-driven system. But I will not make videos about that. It's a politically charged topic. And it's a topic that I'm not personally working in at this point in my career. So I won't touch that. If anybody asks, I'll direct them to the nearest person that I know that does work in that field or to resources on that topic. So that's an example, but I think staying within your lane, if you're not taking the science communicator out, I think that can be protective and sort of goes with what Tom was saying before about not engaging in negative arguments, which I've seen people absolutely burn themselves out doing. And Finally, understanding that uh, social media is all algorithm based. Every moment you're on any one of these platforms, it's building a profile of you and your interests. Every time you comment on a video, every time you're watching even a little bit longer instead of scrolling by, the algorithm is adding that to its database about you. And it's using that to give you more material that it thinks you will like, keep you on the platform longer, because of course that's where its revenue comes from. And it's also categorizing you and your content into one of these networks. It could be forestry, woodworking, wildfire, all of these things. And you can tell how it's working because you see two or three videos of the same topic in a row. And that's always interesting. Oh, yeah. The algorithm has learned a little bit here. It's a wildfire is connected to wildfire. So one, you can go deep on your own network, but also you can consciously go beyond that. So I do a bit of work, woodworking. I don't pretend to be an expert, but I'll show some woodworking content. And that gets me into woodworking TikTok. And then woodworking TikTok comes onto my page and learns something about trees if they uh, didn't know something before. And I do a bit of axes because I enjoy axes much more than a normal healthy person would. And there's a whole variety of people on axe talk. So whatever topic it is, you just add talk on the end and that's your community. So, you can sort of use that and if you find something that you know is popular, and this is advice I'm stealing wholesale from a social media expert also on TikTok, who says that if you find something that people really engage with heavily, and for me that's tree ring analysis, and my PhD was in dendrochronology, so that's appropriate, 
very much my lane, but people really connect with tree rings. Yeah. Do I want that to be my whole platform? No, but I can get 10,000 followers out of a tree ring video. So I'll do that. And her advice was to use these things that you know are going to be popular and then use that to draw an audience to the things that you really want to talk about, which is the profession of forestry for me. So I think that's worked out fairly well for me, but to always be aware that it's an algorithm that's classifying whatever you make and also whatever it is that you're doing on that app. It will show you more of what you watch longer and it will start you out with a very generic for you page. That's the, uh, the main page where it shows the videos. So start out with a very generic thing. You can actually think of it as training the algorithm. You see a forestry video, you like the forestry video. You find forestry prof and look to his commenting on there. It's going to be Alex and a bunch of other folks you can also follow. And sometimes we'll do a video saying, hey, these are all the people that we follow. You can also look at uh, what other, I think you can actually go on my page, hit a button and see who I follow and find Alex and a variety of other people. So understanding that it's an algorithm that's classifying you and your material and not having any illusions about that is a, uh, a good way to go in with open eyes. Great, thanks for that advice. Um, Tom, do you have other advice for forestry professionals? Yeah, well, first of all, I think uh, everything that Neil said is spot on. Um, what I would say is uh, you need to make the decision if you wanna be an effective uh, communicator about forestry, and I do regard myself as a science communicator. Uh, the books I write are for lay audiences. Um, is to, uh, Neil mentioned staying in your lane. One of those ways of staying in your lane is to leave politics out of it because nothing will get people more heated than to talk about anything political. Um, I do talk about issues of race, ethnicity, and sexuality occasionally when it comes up because those are things I feel passionate about is, you know, I think we can all understand that forestry in the past has not been terribly open in those regards. Um, and so I do talk about those. Um, but other than that, I, I, I share almost nothing personal. Um, and so I kind of stick to the topic. I do interact with a lot of people who are in graduate school or postdocs. And I, just this morning, a, a historian that I followed defended his dissertation. So that's an opportunity to, to encourage other people getting their PhDs. But uh, I just think it's really important to decide what your focus is going to be, regardless of what your social media platform is. It, you have to decide what your focus is and stick with it. And Neil summed that up very well. Great. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, Alex, any advice? Um, the main thing that comes to mind is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, just because you are starting a new account doesn't mean that there isn't help. Um, I know I've found several groups who are doing similar work, um, not in exactly the same way. So Women in Wood, um, led by Lacey Rose, is a great organization. Mm -hmm. Um, basically bringing together women who work at every stage of the forest and wood manufacturing process um, and just kind of giving us resources and I, a place to bounce ideas off of each other. Um, there's also, I, I've been working lately with Forest Proud, um, who is an outreach organization focused on communicating that forests are a climate solution. So um, there's going to be local groups that like that we have the Capital District Sports Sportsmen's Association, which is primarily hunters and other sports people, but they will allow me to go in and like lead a forest walk or something. So very much echoing what uh, Tom and Neil were saying about kind of staying in your lane, talking about what you know, primarily. Um, but there are people 
out there. And there are organizations that you can maybe piggyback off of or just kind of reference back to. Um, like Neil was saying, if someone comes at you with a question that you truly do not know the answer to, then reference them to someone who you think does. Um, it's, it's much easier if you remember that you don't have to be a walking encyclopedia. Um, it's hard to remember sometimes because you want to have an answer to every question. <laughs> um, and the only other advice that I would really give would be just try to have fun with it. Um, it. It sucks if you're doing something that you love doing and it stops feeling fun. So try to find ways to keep it fun. Great, thanks for that. Like to, oh, do you have more? I'd like to make one more comment and that is, mm -hmm. um, I think deciding what social media platform you're going to use is important. You know, I was very active on Facebook for a long time before I realized that there are just, were just too many people wasting my time. And, you know, in Twitter, you can be much more selective. I, I actually asked my, one of my kids who's a, who's a graduate student, um, uh, if she's still on Facebook and she said, nah, Facebook is for old people. <laughs> Which is hilarious <laughs> given where it started. But, you know, I think, I think uh, Alex and Neil have inspired me to maybe dip my toe into, into uh, TikTok. But I do think uh, uh, deciding what platform you want to be on and focusing on that is, a, is an important choice that you have to make as a professional. Where can you have the most impact? Not necessarily where you have the largest audience, but where you have the most impact. Great. Um, well, that was the end of the questions. Um, any last comments before we conclude? Um, I want to thank Forestry Prof over here because I, I noticed when I first was starting my account and like I had like 150 followers and somehow he came across my stuff and he was like very <laughs> conscientious about like commenting and interacting with it. Um, and I know he's training the algorithm for his stuff, but it it was very helpful for me. So thank you. <laughs> At that point, my algorithm algorithm was well trained, which is where you came from. And uh, any comments and uh, interaction is all uh, pure encouragement and uh, thumbs up. Wow! Thanks. <laughs> uh, that uh, that algorithm is well oiled machine at this point. It really uh, is. Tom, I I do want to respond to something you said about not anything personal. And I think there's definitely a time and a place for that. TikTok is a bit of a different platform in there where there's sort of an expectation of personal interaction. And it's, you definitely don't want to go too far. And I think never show a negative emotion on film. But aspects of my life, the cat that jumped on my lap before, she's been in a few videos, we will know her name is Ponderosa. There's... I let, I think, a little bit more of my personal life into my content than you might from what I'm hearing. I don't know if either of us is right or wrong, but I think there is a range that can work for a range of people on that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I should say that, you know, I, I have a, a couple of audiences on Twitter. Um, I follow and interact with a lot of writers. Uh, I'm in a, in a Kentucky writers group here in Lyston, we're, we're a very, uh, Kentucky writers are very tightly knit. So folks like Wendell Berry and Silas House and Bobby Ann Mason are all, we all eat lunch together and <laughs> hang out. So I, I do hang out with, with some writers. Um, I'm also a religious person. I'm a, a leader in my Episcopal church and I do a certain amount of, of interaction in that regard. I, I guess when I, you know, when I, when I was thinking of not being personal, I, I don't do the kind of, you know, oh, I'm having a lousy day or, you know, I really don't like what I'm doing anymore. Or, you know, I had pizza for lunch. Those are the kinds of, I guess I, those are kind of personal things that I just don't want to talk to other people about. Mm -hmm. No, I, I fully agree with that. Anything, anything bad, you know, lunch, if it's a particularly good lunch, maybe, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I completely agree that any, any negative aspects, it's, it's not for that. 
Um, I will add on that to what you were saying about TikTok and Twitter being very, very different platforms. Um, when it comes to written communication, you, there's an extra level of almost separation. Um, you can kind of vet what you're saying. You can disown it to a certain extent once it's out there. Um, with video communications, like TikTok especially, um, I think a lot of what draws people into your audience is your personality. So if you can find kind of a happy medium between being yourself and being like outgoing with that and honest about it, um, and also not telling people exactly where you live and how to find you. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> there's, there's a happy medium there that I think mm -hmm. it's important to figure out for yourself where that happy medium is for you before you start making things. Because like Neil said, sometimes things explode and there, you can't predict what it's going to be, and who knows what's going to come your way when that happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I've, I've heard time and again the negative that can come with that, especially for female creators, that I'm fortunate not to have that problem. One, this is Maine. I live here. If anybody <laughs> would like to visit, it's a long drive. <laughs> but I, it, it is a very serious thing to consider, that you can get some serious wing nuts when things go to a wider audience and it's very unfortunate when it happens. One other point that might seem minor to uh, people outside of TikTok is captions. That for a lot of users, the captions are something they rely on for one, understanding a main accent and two, for a variety of other reasons. It was a huge deal when TikTok finally added an auto close caption feature that before I was literally, I would make the video without a script, I would then write down whatever I said and paste that into text and plop that into the video. It was exhausting, but people came to rely on it. So when now we have auto closed caption, and if you're getting into that, I strongly encourage you to use it because one, there's people who genuinely need it. And I've had it for so long that I come to expect it when I'm just scrolling myself. So I, I think that's, that's one, technical point to consider if you're going into that platform. All right, well, um, that was all the questions. So thank you all for your time and for sharing your insights and experience with SAF members. Thanks. And for now I'm going to